Thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction, Karen, and very warm welcome that I've had since, since I've arrived. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes? I have one of these mics on, and rather than project, I think this will probably help make sure. How are we in the sound booth? Okay. First of all, I want to take a moment just to congratulate the Columbia Museum of Art again for receiving this National Medal for Museum Service from the White House. Michelle Obama herself awarding the, uh, making the award presentation. It's obvious that everybody here and the staff has worked very long and hard hours to create excellent programming and to bring the museum's work to the attention of others who care about museums and their role as cultural and educational anchors in our communities. It's a monumental achievement and recognition, and bravo. <laughs> so today is, for me, somewhat of a homecoming. My first trip to the Columbia Museum was in 1982 with the original publication of Defusky Island, a photographic essay, the title of the book. I first held, actually held the completed book in my hands, which, by the way, was the first book that I published, right here in this museum, coinciding with both the pub date and the opening of the exhibition of all 68 black and white gelatin silver photographs, which I had printed in my dark room in the early 1980s. If you're wondering why this is worth mentioning, how often do you hear the words gelatin silver? <laughs> or even dark room today? <laughs> While I am surely dating myself, this unique collection is a treasure of images that honestly exists nowhere else. It's also an archival, as, as your um, chief curator can tell you, it's archival because it was printed at the time that the photographs were taken. So there's a lot of value in the images, and it was intentional that they be here in Colombia for both artistic and historical purposes. Placing it here, though, was not a decision that was made lightly. However, the University of South Carolina Press did publish the book, and they published the anniversary edition as well. So it just all made perfect sense. What an honor it's been to work on this project, to say the least, to work with the people you will see in the images and those that I have met along the way over these past 39 years. Not only has the island changed, but it has also held the mirror up, showing me how much I have changed over the almost four decades since I first visited Defusky. In recent history, developers came to Defusky in the early 1980s when there were only 52 permanent residents left on the island. Today, if you were to Google Defusky Island, of the top 10 Google search results, Eight are vacation resort properties, and only two are historic. In 2007, though, the census counted 429 full-time residents living on the entire island. So in 2007, <coughs> excuse me, a friend of mine suggested that a celebration of 25 years since the first publication of Defusky Island, a photographic essay, I should think about revisiting and republishing the book again. At first, it seemed to me that the project was completed, finished, and closed. But then at her suggestion, I decided to review the contact sheets, another Neanderthal <laughs> term, <laughs> and gradually realize that I was seeing them somewhat differently than I had seen them 25 years before. Soon it became truly remarkable that there were so many images that were newly interesting to me on those same contact sheets that I had not really seen before. 
For instance, there's a photograph of two little girls. Their names are Katrina and Monique that I had not noticed before, but that when I looked at them, I, I was gobsmacked. <laughs> what made me see it in 2007, but not in 1982? Now, was I seeing these beautiful children's faces for the first time? And then it hit me. I was not a mother when I took that image. And because of that, I saw this differently. I saw that becoming a mother had changed my view of the world. While I responded to their sweet, curious faces in the late 70s, I did not really see them until 2007, after raising a child myself. This was a very meaning discovery for me. So much had transpired in my life, both love and loss, but coming back to this project is what helped me see how those experiences had changed me. So when I think of the changes on Defusky, it certainly forces me to see the changes in myself. Now, it's 2016, and while working on these remarks and revisiting the images, as a result of the CMA invitation and exhibition, I have yet another discovery. Over the past couple of years, I have seen a profound exhibition by the artist Jacob Lawrence at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. And I've read two revelatory books engaging with the same theme. The two books are Warmth of Other Suns by Isabel Wilkerson, maybe some of you have read that, and Between the World and Me by ta Coates. The Jacob Lawrence exhibition was titled Migration. And yes, all three works deal with the great migration of the late 19th and 20th century. Reading about and delving into the great migration in black history, my mind kept returning to the Defuskians and their isolation on the island with no bridge linking them to the mainland. <clears throat> Could it be that the experiences of the black community on the mainland may not have been the experiences on Defusky? The Defuskians were land rich and fairly independent. During that period, they thrived with the resources available to them from the land and the water the resources that surrounded them, not least of all themselves. So I asked myself this question, was there a need for Defuskians to migrate to other places when they had resources in abundance? In addition to family and church, Union Baptist Church, <clears throat> they had a school, Mary Fields Elementary School, a postal service which was run by Billy Burns, and very low property taxes without development all on the island, in addition to freedom from Jim Crow. I honestly don't know the answer, but only speculate. After reading all of the reasons why blacks le left the South, that Defuskians may not have had that desire. While we can always speculate, I often think with a smile on my face about one of the islanders referring to me as a fakamya. A what? I said, they explained that if you were from Defusky Island, you were a forbinya. If you were a visitor on Defusky, you were a fakamya. So that put me in my place, and I defer to that now. In 2016, I am just a for Kamya. What I do know is that for this for Kamya, in these images, Antheos resonates. Antheos is the root of the word enthusiasm. It comes to our language by way of French and Latin with its origins in ancient Greek. It translates to a god within. 
Thus, enthusiasm originally meant more than a strong feeling of excitement. It was to be inspired by God. Some of these images are obviously spiritual due to the subject matter, members during a church service, a prayer house, but to Fusky Island, in history, in my personal narrative, and as a seeming portal to another time, exudes a certain divinity as a place. Tefusky is an important study and narrative in Americana. After the Civil War, when plantation owners fled, that land became hallowed ground for the freed slaves who remained. In addition to Antheos deriving from the content or subject of an image, there is an additional force that stems from the process of photography. Light. It is the essential enabler of every painter's and every photographer's art. The great impressionists, Monet, Degas, Renoir, Bonnard, known as gifted painters, especially in their ability to capture the essence of light, all studied photography first. Every photograph represents not just a specific moment in time, but a specific moment of light. I pursue light's constantly changing qualities, trying to find, to capture, and to preserve what light reveals and what it hides. What I work with is not really film or mercury <clears throat> or emulsion or gelatin silver or digital files. What I work with is light. When I make a photograph, I adhere to the process that relies heavily on intuition. This process can only or can often precipitate a photograph that is not predicated on rational thought or preconception. Rather, it comes from some unknown internal wellspring. In tapping that, the most successful photographs capture more than simply what is there. Some other energy pervades the images, something glorious, something heavenly, even perhaps divine. Looking back at how I originally ended up on Defusky, as an artist, this body of work represents the culmination of an idea born while on independent study in West Africa during my junior year of college in 1974. While standing at the porthole of the Cape Coast Castle in Ghana, the last stop for many slaves before embarking for the New World, and looking out at the vast, endless expanse of water, I thought of the slave journey, the horrors that awaited their transatlantic crossing and the additional horrors that awaited their arrival. At once, I decided that I had to visit the terminus of that journey, the southeastern seaboard of the United States and its sea islands. The images you see in the exhibit stem from that realization on the coast. They reveal the dignity, beauty, and promise that can eventually come forth as a result of even the most depraved and heinous acts, the light that can emerge from the darkness. Taking a moment to look back at Defusky's history, the first inhabitants, inhabitants were Native Americans until the 16th and 17th century. European explorers arrived on the island. Areas of Defusky carry titles like Bloody Point, describing skirmishes between its inhabitants and the explorers. After the Revolutionary War, plantation owners thrived with the introduction of Sea Island cotton. By the end of the Civil War, the island's former slaves remained after the owners fled, turning the land over to them. Oystering replaced cotton as the island's main industry when the boll weevil infestation ruined crops. Oysters continued to dominate up through the 1950s, but due to pollution in the nearby Savannah River, 
oyster beds were lost and the island economy was still in flux by the time I arrived in the late 70s. While my first trip to the Sea Islands in the spring of 1977 had no destination, I only hoped for a journey ahead. Looking for experiences, seeing, meeting people, and I did find a warm welcome on every island I visited, but especially Edisto Island, my first real connection. The photograph you'll see of the girl in the screen door taken on Edisto seems more like a metaphor to me now. It was the door that led me into the Sea Island experience. When I returned to New York after that first visit, I called a friend of mine, author Donald Vogel, to tell him about my trip. He immediately suggested that I speak with author Verda Mae Grosvenor, who was from Beaufort, South Carolina. Then by chance, I met Verda in the spring of 78 at the Corso Club in New York. We were both there listening to Cuban drummers and I told her that I was interested in talking to her about the Sea Islands and that a friend of mine, Donald, suggested that I get in touch with her before my next trip down. I mentioned that I had been to Edisto and John's Island. I had heard that she was from South Carolina and had some information about some of the other islands. She asked me if I had visited Defusky. When I said no, she said, you haven't seen anything yet. You have to go to Defusky. We spoke several times after that night, and she insisted that she contact a good friend of hers who lived on Hilton Head. If you want to go to Defusky, Verda said, you should go with Emery Campbell. He knows everything about the islands. And I understand that uh, through Kaylee that Emory Campbell will be speaking here on the 21st of July. He is one of my heroes. And without going too much off on a tangent, um, Emory was born on Hilton Head Island and attended, I believe, Tufts University for his undergraduate, went back and received his master's and then a PhD. And what did Emory do? He came back to the islands, to Hilton Head, and worked for 36, 37 years as the director of the Penn Center on St. Helena Island. That's a hero. That's a hero. I hope you'll all come out and hear him speak. And one little tip, if I can't make it to that, someone please ask Emery if it's appropriate to recite the Lord's Prayer in Gullah. It's remarkable. So my first trip to Defusky was with Emery and his wife, Emma, who is also a PhD and from the islands. Emery opened a lot of doors for me and helped me to get to know the Fusky people. He introduced me to Susie Smith, with whom I always stayed during my visits to the island. Although I made several trips alone, I was fortunate enough to be accompanied on some trips by good friends. There are some people who are directly involved with my time there, and although those experiences were tangential to the photographic work, they were integral to the project as a whole. Some of them were quite memorable visits. Verda May and I made a trip together, an unforgettable experience. One I remember is the first time <clears throat> walking down a road in Defusky. This is obviously before the development. And she recommended that I pick up a big stick in case, in case a snake jumped out. That really did me in. But it, they loved to tease me. And another girlfriend of mine, who's a doctor, an OBGYN from New York, after hearing me talk so much about Tefusky, decided to spend an entire week there during vacation from her medical practice. Now remember, this was before there were any hotels on the island. She stayed with Susie Smith and found the experience fascinating. The islanders then wanted her to stay, as surely they wanted the convenience of a doctor right there on Tefusky. 
my late husband, Arthur, traveled with me on some of my first visits. He enjoyed his visits, even would, when I'd get him up at 4 in the morning to go on James Murray's shrimp boat. I remember taking a picture of him fast asleep at 6, 6 a.m. on Mr. Murray's cot. James used to keep that photo prominently displayed on his boat. And I found out that Arthur sure did love fish sandwiches with hot sauce. <laughs> He's a southerner himself. He was, he's a Virginian. So I often found him sitting around Susie Smith's living room with several islanders ex exchanging stories about how far somebody's grandmother could spit tobacco. <laughs> My trips to the islands were always big fun. In the early stages, though, the islanders were not receptive to my taking pictures of them but I just kept going back. They always asked me, why? Why are you taking these pictures? Every time I took a picture of the old prayer house, they would say, you already took a picture of that. Why are you taking another one? And then, after Hurricane David knocked it down in 1979, they didn't ask me anymore. I think they began to understand what I was doing. And then they seemed to enjoy seeing the pictures. I would show them with each return visit. Soon I was invited to take pictures at Ella May's daughter's wedding, Janice, who married Joe. Then in January 1982, Susie Smith called me to tell me that the island matriarch, Blossom Robinson, had died and that I must come down. I took photographs at the funeral, although even at that point, some people still didn't like that. I might mention, too, that Blossom's granddaughter is Sally Ann Robinson, who will also be coming, I believe, to speak while the exhibit is up. She's now an, an American cookbook author, celebrity chef, and cultural historian. So it did take time to gain the confidence of the Defusky folks. They saw a lot of people come and go, snapping pictures of them and having the photos turn up in magazines without their permission, just about anywhere. So they were understandably reserved. But let me say one thing about the people I met on Defusky. They were extremely considerate and thoughtful. They would send Christmas cards, get well cards, and other treats as well. On one visit, I mentioned to Shorty Smith how much I liked her candied yams, and when I returned to New York, she sent me her recipe. At Christmas one year, Susie Smith sent me a box of fresh pecans from the pecan tree in her yard. When the first book was published in 1982, the CMA hosted the exhibition of images from the book. Many folks from Defusky, including Mrs. Frances Jones, the first school teacher on the island, Emery and Emma Campbell, and others from Defusky attended the opening. You can imagine how honored I was to have them come here. At one point after the book came out, I had a conversation with Susie Smith, and she told me that everybody was pretty pleased with the book. That was important to me and still is because I could not have done it without them. Defusky was their island, their home, and those photographs were about them. The fact that they were pleased made me very, very happy. Lastly, <clears throat> I'd like to close with a couple of thoughts. If there is something we can be sure of, it's change. It's inevitable. What is important to note, though, is that when we develop land, we need to develop people as well. And we can develop people through education. Here is a thought in Gullah. Give it a shot. If one day from the low country and the island look ya a the time for go back. This year, that way for come together with we people for hold on to the things while we people left we. The translation is, if you are someone that is concerned about the preservation of the branch of Africa's tree that has grown in America, 
This is a way for you to assist in nurturing and protecting that branch. I would like to thank my hosts, the Columbia Museum of Art, its staff and board of directors, Karen Brocious and Will South, for making this visit possible for me. Of course, all of my gratitude goes to the folks who nurtured me through those days on Defusky and created Defusky memories that will always remain with me. Without question, I fell under the spell of the Low Country. I want to thank you all for coming to the museum today to see the exhibition, and I hope you enjoy it. And before I open up, if anyone has questions, there's, um, I don't have to ask if there's anybody from Defusky in the audience, because I do know someone who is here from Defusky, who is a new resident, and her name is Jenny Hirsch. Where are you sitting, Jenny Hirsch? Ah, <laughs> of course, she's up front. So if um, anyone wants to know any questions or have any questions about uh, Defusky today and what's happening in the community and what's happening, we've got somebody right here, and I thank you for coming. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions, if there are any from the audience. Thank you.